I've made several videos at this point using Burp Suite, but there is a pretty major feature of Burp Suite that I don't believe I've covered at all, and that's the intruder. So in this video, I'm going to be using the intruder to solve one of the Web Security Academy labs, specifically dealing with user enumeration and password brute forcing. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to the Web Security Academy listing for all their labs, and I'm going to go to the authentication section, and I'm going to look at the very first lab, user enumeration via different responses. So if we read the description of this lab, it says, this lab is vulnerable to a username enumeration and password brute force attacks. It has an account with a predictable username and password, which can be found in the following word list. So they actually provide word lists that we can use to solve this lab. But if you didn't have a word list, there are plenty of word lists out there that you can download off of GitHub or wherever. And actually, if you have installed a virtual machine or anything using Kali or Parrot, I believe both of those operating systems actually come with several word lists already pre-installed. But to get started on the lab, we're going to boot up Burp Suite and we're going to open up the lab within the browser inside the proxy tab. And when we do that, we get this little blog here. And because the point of this lab is to enumerate the users and brute force the password, we're going to need to get to the login page. So we're going to click on my account. Now we see this login page and we're going to just say test for username, test its password. So we can get that request that's used to log in. And if we look at our HTTP history, we see that this post request right here is going to send the username and the password and the response says invalid username. So to get an idea about how you would go about figuring this out if you were not in a lab scenario and just without any instruction, the fact that this login page responded with invalid username is kind of a giveaway that this might be something that could be used to enumerate usernames. Because it has that very specific error message that doesn't just say uh, incorrect credentials, access denied, something like that, you know specifically that the username that you sent is incorrect. So we're going to take this post request that sent the username and password, and we're going to right click it and send to intruder. So according to the instructions, this lab is vulnerable to both user enumeration and password brute forcing. First, we're going to do the user enumeration part to find a valid username. So we're going to use the sniper attack type. We're going to click the clear button over here on the right to get rid of all those pre-populated selections. And then we're going to highlight the username and click add to mark that as the parameter that we want to brute force using that sniper attack. Now we're going to go to payloads. And this is where that word list that was provided in the lab is going to come in handy. So if we open this candidate usernames, it's going to give us this word list of a bunch of different usernames. And we're just going to copy this entire list and we're going to paste it in our payload options. So now we have one payload set, which is our username. And we're going to use a simple list as our payload type. And we have our list that we copied from the lab. Now that we have all our options set, we can click start attack. Now, if you're using the community edition, which is what I'm using for this example, it will pop up this little warning letting you know that this is a demo version of the intruder and some functions are disabled and the attacks are time throttled, which just means that the attack is going to be a little bit slower than it could be, which is fine for this kind of example. But if you are doing this kind of thing professionally, like if you are a professional pen tester or a red teamer or something like that, then you probably want to get the pro version of Burp Suite, which is not going to time throttle your attacks like this and will also give you some other features that you don't have in the community edition. So that's just something to keep in mind if you do keep going further with this and make this into your career. But at this point, if you're just doing labs and learning and doing things like that, the community edition is just fine. So now that we clicked OK, we see that it is sending the payloads. And here's the payload that it's trying. As you can see, it's putting that payload in the username. And it's keeping the password as test, which is the one that we used in our original example. And then you can see the response to each of those requests as well. 
Once again, in this one, is giving us an invalid username response, so we know that Carlos is not the correct username, but it's going to go through that entire list. Eventually, it will provide us a response that is different, and that's when we know that we will have a correct username. So you may be wondering, are we just going to have to look through the response to every single one of these requests until we get the right one? And the answer is no. There are actually a few different ways that we can verify if we are getting something different in the response without actually looking at every single one of them. And one of those ways is the status code. So if you look at the very top of the response, it is responding with a HTTP 200 OK. And if it gets a different kind of response, it might respond with something other than a 200 OK. That's not always going to be the case. It might give you a 200 no matter what the response is, but these are the kind of things you want to pay attention to. Another thing you can check is the response length. So this 2,984, that is the length of the response. Since every invalid username response is exactly the same, they're all going to be the same length. But if that error message is different, then it may be a different length. So that's just another thing that we can look at to see if there's something different in the response. And we can do this pretty quickly using the sort function. So right now you can see at the very top it's got this little caret right here saying that it's sorting by request, which just means the order in which they were sent, that's the way they're being displayed in this table. Now if we wanted to sort by the status, we can see if there's anything that's a different status code. So we click on status. And we see uh, they look like they're all 200. We sort by the other direction, still all 200s. Again, this is just something to check if you're seeing if there's something different in a response. So now let's go to the next one that we talked about, and that's the length of the response. Unless by some unlucky coincidence, the error message that they presented has the exact same number of characters as the error message that we were getting from the previous one, then it should have a different length to the response. So if we go from lowest to greatest, we're getting a bunch of 2,984. If we sort the other direction, now we are seeing one response that is a different length than the others. This one is 2,986 instead of 2,984. So let's check that one out. So for this one, the payload was app. And if we just render it so we can look at what it looks like, this one actually says incorrect password instead of incorrect username. Because of that error message, we now know that this app payload, that is a valid username. Since this lab was also vulnerable to password brute forcing, we can use the intruder again to actually find the correct password for this username. Again, we're going to clear everything and we're going to replace the username with app, which is that username that we found in our previous test. And now we're going to mark the password field as the one that we want to test. Once again, we're going to use a sniper attack and we're going to use a simple list as our payload type, but this time we're going to use a different password list. So we're going to clear everything from the list that we had before, and this time we're going to use this password list that was provided in the lab. Once again, we're going to copy this entire list and we're going to paste in our payload options and that now we have all our options set for this one and we're going to once again start the attack. So now that it has completed and gone through every payload in that list, once again, we can sort our results to see if we find anything that looks different. So once again, I'm gonna start with sorting by status code. First I sort least to greatest and then I'm gonna sort greatest to least. And here we see that we have a 302 status code, which is different than all the 200s. So if we look at that one, we're going to look at the response and we see that we have a 302 found. And you'll also notice that if we look at the response length, that is also different. So by sorting either one of those, we would have found the correct one but I just happen to do status code first. So now we see that seven sevens is the payload that was successful. So I'm gonna go back to the login page and I'm gonna type in app as my username and I'm gonna type in seven sevens as my password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm gonna click login. And 
I just solved the lab because I was able to enumerate usernames and find the correct username, and then I was able to brute force the password to find the password and log in with that username. So it's worth noting that if that username and the password weren't present in those lists that were provided by the lab, then we would not be successful. Obviously, if the username is not in the list that you're using to find the username, then you can't find it and same for the password. But there are a lot of very long password and username lists that have many, many commonly found usernames and passwords in them. And these kind of attacks are the reason that, that there are all those requirements on a bunch of different websites where they require you to have a certain amount of letters or special characters or numbers in your password. And there are always all those warnings about not reusing passwords or don't use common usernames or all of those kind of things. All of that is to prevent attackers from using these kinds of attacks to hack your account. Also, if you are a developer and you're building a website or an application or anything like that, this is the reason that you should have very generic error messages. Also, I think it's worth mentioning, even if an application cannot be hacked through password brute forcing, like you have rate limiting or you have a CAPTCHA or something like that, it can also be a problem if the username can be enumerated like we did in the first part of this lab. Because if a attacker can use these kinds of attacks just to enumerate all of the active user accounts on your website, then they can use that information as part of a much larger attack, like a phishing campaign or something like that. So it's not nearly as serious as password brute forcing because they can't actually log into the accounts. If you're able to enumerate the users of a website or an application, then it's still something that should be reported even if you can't brute force the password.